Hey, everybody. I am so excited and honored to have Amber Sears with me today on the podcast. Amber, thank you for coming on. Yes, thank you so much for having me. Very, very excited to be here. Oh, I'm so excited for everyone listening <laughs> to hear from you. Um, we met at Paleo FX, and I just felt like it was an instant, like, spiritual sister connection. I was yes. like, I know you. <laughs> so, um, yeah, do you mind telling everybody a little bit about your story, like your journey in physical and spiritual health? Yeah, absolutely. So my whole journey, I always say started with dance because I've been a dancer since I can remember. Um, age three, my mom put me in ballet. And um, so I've been training. I was a trained dancer, uh, competitively, you know, competed age, I'd say like eight to 18. I was on the, com- the competition circuit regionally and nationally. And so dance was a huge aspect of my life, like literally what I lived for. Loved it, loved it. I was uh, naturally pretty gifted in in the uh, different techniques that I was training in. And I went on to dance professionally um, through college and I got my degree in dance performance and choreography and went on to dance professionally in San Francisco for eight years after that. So wow. dance and, and movement and expression, it has been a massive part of, of what um, matters to me in my life, right? So following my heart has been a, a let's say, a theme in my life. Um, but along that journey, as you can imagine, like for me trying to be the best performer I could be, one that would endure longer, perform better, recover faster, I had a lot of injuries along the journey <laughs> and a lot of things that I had to learn about how to stay in peak condition. Um, everything from meditation to yoga to Pilates to plant-based nutrition, all the different tools and modalities that I now teach, I found on my journey because I was trying to be the best dancer I could be and I was trying to prevent injury and recover from injuries. And so I have so it's like so many stories I could share about all those different paths that I found. But Pilates was really the first one that was a, a huge turning point for me because I was experiencing really chronic um, low back pain from age like 13 to 19 when I found Pilates, I was experiencing, uh, I had stress fractures and L4, oh, L5 wow. from all of my dance training. And it was basically just an overuse injury. Like my, my teachers were having me perform and dance in certain ways that were just way too intense on my back at the time. And so I didn't, I you know, went to chiropractors, went to physical therapists, and nobody could touch the root of why I was having so much pain. And so until I found Pilates. So I was in really bad pain for many years until I found Pilates at age 19 in college. And Pilates was a part of our conditioning program as dancers. So we would dance like six hours a day. But before dance, we were mandated to go to Pilates. And it was a Pilates mat practice. And that was like our conditioning pr- and like maintenance program. And within two weeks, my back pain completely vanished. Wow. And I was like, what is going on? I must know what is going on. I must know this method fully, not only just to like rebalance my body, but also to give back to other people because Mm -hmm. I didn't want anyone to suffer the way that I had with no answers. Like at age 13, I could have been sidelined for the rest of my dance career Mm -hmm. and never gotten to fulfill that dream and also not ever move the way that I I knew I could and pain-free for the rest of my life. Like they basically were like, you can't, you shouldn't be running and you shouldn't be doing these certain things. I'm like, I'm like 15. Are you kidding me? Like there's gotta be a better way, you know? And so, so, so there's, the answers are out there, but they weren't obvious to me at the time. They weren't actually being provided in a way that I could find them. So I was very passionate about sharing the power of Pilates and giving back and doing that. So that was like the first modality I found. And then yoga became my next obsession and addiction. I dove into yoga and then I dove into plant-based nutrition and I've been vegan for 10 years now. So plant-based nutrition is a huge aspect of my ability to perform to perform at my best, recover quickly, all those good things that I was looking for, but also to help people transition to just a more organic whole food diet um, as a nutritionist. So that's been a part of my work as well. And so along the journey, um, you know, I became a coach and I was doing holistic uh, nutrition and fitness and lifestyle coaching basically. And I created these packages that were all encompassing, that used all these different modalities that I know and love. And I've been doing that for 10 years now. So it's been quite a journey. And, um, and now my real emphasis is, um, I'm, I produce a lot of retreats and I 
run teacher training programs and I have online courses and all sorts of stuff that's shifted. So my business has shifted a lot over the years, but it's all still with the same emphasis and focus of helping people heal, transform and awaken into the highest version of themselves. And of course, everyone's very unique as to what that is, but um, all these different tools and techniques help people achieve that for themselves. So it's been really fun. And, but my health journey has been yeah, really, really um, organic, I'd say, in the way that it's evolved just through a lot of experimentation. You know, what does and doesn't work for me. Um, yeah, so that's kind of in a nutshell. <laughs> yeah, I love it. Can you tell me what got you transitioned into these retreats? Yeah, so I mean, for me, at a very young age, I knew that travel was going to be a big part of my life. I absolutely love traveling. Like age 18, I went on my first backpacking trip to Thailand, and I was so in love with this concept of being a digital nomad, like, like location independent business yeah. owner where I could travel and teach what I love and what I know is like really impactful for people, but do it in beautiful places mm-hmm. where they could immerse in a new culture and a new environment and really have some big shifts that way. Because really my addiction is transformation. I love seeing people transform mind, body, and spirit. And so I knew from my own experiences that if I I saw my deepest transformations when I was out of the country in a new culture, experiencing a new land. And so I said, I want to bring this to people because retreats have transformed me so much. So I've started producing retreats, I'd say about eight years ago. My first retreat was in Mexico Mm -hmm. um, because I was living in San Francisco at the time. So I just thought I'd do something close to California. And then I went to Australia and Bali and uh, Costa Rica and, you know, and then I ended up moving to Costa Rica six years ago to really immerse full time in a different culture and live somewhere completely different. Um, So that was really fun down there, too. But, yeah, retreats were retreats to me are one of the most magical things that um, I get to experience and that I get to share with other people. Uh, Yeah, it's quite a magical container that happens and what can shift for people is pretty profound. Yeah, absolutely. Like, good job winning life and designing your life (laughs) the way that you want it to be while you get to be so fulfilled by bringing joy to other people. That's so awesome. So, like, what do your retreats retreats involve? So the base of my most current retreats, so I've produced all types of retreats over the years, everything from, like, yoga teacher trainings to Rasha teacher trainings to yoga retreats, Pilates retreats. But over the last five years, um, along my journey in Costa Rica, I sat in a medicine ceremony, specifically ayahuasca, and this master plant from the Amazon just radically changed everything. I, I went through a deep healing process. And so I began to incorporate ayahuasca ceremonies into my yoga retreats. And so the last several years, last five years, I've been running one retreat specifically called the Epic Awakening, and it's a shamanic yoga retreat. So it includes daily yoga, meditation, myofascial release classes. Wow. Um, there's two ayahuasca ceremonies that are, of course, I don't serve medicine. I work with some very experienced shaman. Mm-hmm. And so they're serving the ceremonies. We have integration coaching, integration workshops. Um, we go on a couple day adventures to like the local national park, which is super beautiful, pristine wow. beaches and waterfalls and, you know, all the beautiful avatar-like yeah. landscape that is Costa Rica. We all, we get to explore all that, which is so fun. And uh, to me, you know, really connecting people to nature um, is is really special and really necessary nowadays. Mm -hmm. I feel like most people are very disconnected from nature. And Mm -hmm. so really immersing them in what it can feel like to live in the jungle, to be in the water and the ocean every day um, is, is really special in and of itself. And I see a lot of transformation just with that, but then also working with plant medicine and yoga. It's mm-hmm. yeah. Very profound. What happens okay. for people. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Let's, Let's dig into this a little bit because, yeah. um, some of my audience knows that I did ayahuasca in Costa Rica last, uh, September or October. Sure. And it was also extremely profound for me. And it's also where I fell in love with yoga. They had yoga at this retreat as well. And it has been extremely healing for me, not just spiritually, but also like I'm a marathon runner and I lift a lot and I used to always get pulled hamstrings. Right. And I've been sprinting like crazy. No more. Yoga has totally helped me with that too. Um, but I want to dig into the ayahuasca thing a little bit because I know so many people have questions on this. Yeah. And since you've had the opportunity of working with so many people, like, could you maybe explain for people listening what the ayahuasca experience is like and what kind of benefits you've seen from it? Yeah, absolutely. So 
the way it's so first of all um the, the ayahuasca tradition is thousands and thousands of years old and there's different lineages within this entire new world that many westerners are brand new to right but it's it's been there for six thousand years so like the Shipibo, for example are based in the amazon in peru and they've been working with ayahuasca for six thousand years so this is a very very ancient practice that is now becoming known in the western world and so a lot of people are coming down to peru or brazil or colombia where there's different lineages of this work so the peruvians serve ayahuasca very differently from the brazilians brazilians serve it very differently from the colombians they all have their own rituals and ways of working with it but to simplify what uh, you would experience within a ceremony in the tradition that i work in uh it's a it's set in a temple space that's outdoors in the jungle which is a very important uh, in my experience, in my work, that you are sitting in the environment where the medicine is grown because it's very special to be in the jungle and to be experiencing such a high vibrational medicine that's very much connecting you to the planet. So ayahuasca mm-hmm. is many people, when they experience ayahuasca, they experience it as they are interfacing with the spirit of the earth or the spirit of the vine the ayahuasca vine. And so this medicine deeply connects you to nature. And so being in nature makes it that much more special. Um, so, so the temple we work in is outdoors, for example. Um, and then the Peruvian tradition is very much done in the dark. So it, if you were to look at it from the outside, it looks like people are sitting in meditation or they're laying down just, you know, on mattresses and blankets, it's like really cozy. And it's very much an inward journey. So eyes are closed, it's dark in the temple, there's one candle in the middle of the temple. And everybody is given a certain amount of ayahuasca, which is this blend of two, the classical blend is half chacruno leaf and half ayahuasca vine. So it's a brew that's made over three days, you know, it's brewed for three days over the fire. And it's served in small doses to people in in the circle, of course. So everyone gets their own cup and uh, the journey is very much a there's lots of things that can happen within the journey so every night is different and everybody is working on different healing aspects of themselves so um you know you come to this experience with some intention and no expectations because this is a very healing medicine that works mentally emotionally physically it works on all levels so And it also works on ancestral lines. So not only are you working on healing yourself in this life, but you're also working on your ancestral lines, which can be very hard for Westerners to wrap their brain around because it's like this whole Mm -hmm. new world, right? You're stepping into the spirit realm. You're stepping into other dimensions with this work. So ayahuasca opens up the pineal gland, which allows you to access the multidimensional nature of the soul and to really begin to interface with the spirit world. So many people will see spirits, they will see loved ones, they will interface and interact with them. They will interface and interact with the spirit of ayahuasca, the vine um, itself. And so this, this plant, ayahuasca, is known as a teacher and doctor plant in the Amazon. It is like the master plants of all master plants that shamans have been working with forever. And so what it's doing, not only is it healing you physically, but it's also working on the subconscious mind and the emotional body. So many people, what they experience is like a very big emotional release, um, emotional baggage, stuff that they've been carrying for their entire lives, that their ancestors have been carrying for lifetimes. That sort of work, uh, that sort of emotional baggage can be released within a ceremony. So, for example, like my first ceremony, it felt like I cried out 10 years of emotional baggage that I had been carrying. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, And then another aspect of this is working on the mind. So the subconscious mind is, is the part of the mind that we are not aware of in our waking life. Like it's kind of the what's below the veil of what we're conscious of but the subconscious mind rules our lives like the patterns that we experience the belief systems that we have the behaviors we play out in our life are all rooted in the subconscious mind and so until we're aware of those areas of our life and why we do what we do at the root level it's very hard to change patterns and so what a lot of people experience in these ceremonies is a macro perspective of themselves and they can see their mind and their patterns in a whole new way they can maybe go back to a childhood experience that was the root to why they act out the way they do now as an adult. And so there's so much healing that can happen in that and clearing of energies that are no longer serving you mentally, emotionally, and physically. Um, So that's just kind of scratching the surface of what people experience. So in terms of the benefits, people experience profound shifts in every aspect of their life. So whether they have a realization about their purpose in life, 
Uh, this is called the vine of the soul. Ayahuasca is called the vine of the soul. So it connects you to your soul in a huge way. And many people all of a sudden have realizations about why they're here in this life, like what their soul's mission is, their purpose. Um, many people have very big cathartic emotional releases like I did where in my first ceremony where I was able to process a lot of the pain I was carrying. And so then afterward, that pain no longer held me down. I created all this new space opened up my heart, healed my heart in so many ways that then my whole external reality shifted because then how I saw the world and how I interfaced with the world was completely different because I wasn't carrying that baggage anymore. Mm -hmm. um, so people of all different health issues also come to my ceremonies, people who have anxiety, depression, autoimmune disorder, cancer, like you name it, all the different um, autoimmune stuff is really common nowadays. But what people can experience in terms of shifts of their mental, emotional state which is really the root to so much of our physical issue, mm -hmm. issues and disease that we experience is really a, a mental, emotional root. And so when you get to the root of that, then the physical ailments can start to shift really quickly. And so I've seen some pretty miraculous healing stuff that you wouldn't see in like the Western world. And I've had many people come down who have been through the Western approaches and had no actual legitimate shifts happening, <laughs> right? Like they maybe take a lot of pharmaceuticals, they have surgeries, different things like that. And they're on the last leg of their healing journey. They don't know where else to go for healing and help. And they end up coming to the jungle and everything shifts because they're working on the mental, emotional levels. And that's, like I said, that oftentimes the root to the physical stuff. So it's, it's profound what can happen when you start to open up your mind to what's possible in this ancient work. Wow. Thank you for putting that so elegantly. Oh, sure. I was like, yes, yes, that's exactly what happened. That's exactly what it feels like. And it's um, honestly, I love that you're combining the nature experiences with it. Um, I think that that has probably been one of the biggest things that stuck with me since doing ayahuasca is how connected I feel to nature yeah. <laughs> since then. Um, it's like almost like <laughs> I sound like such a hippie now. I never saw this coming, <laughs> but I just, it almost calls to me, you know, and I feel like um, it's, it's almost God, like it's majestic. It's, it's personal to me, you know, and I love that you combine that. It's so beautiful. I want to go now. <laughs> okay. So you said that you have lots of retreats and other coaching projects you're working on. So tell us what else you're into. Yeah. So one of the other, so, you know, these retreats, these health and wellness focused retreats have been my, my entire focus for, I'd say the last decade, but then in the last five years, I've really started coaching uh, leaders in the health and wellness community. So a lot of people coming to me asking, how did you build the business that you did, Amber? How did you go about this? Like, how did you structure your lifestyle so you can travel? How did you build your business online? So I've been doing a lot of business coaching. And so one of my most um, exciting new projects I'm building is a six month online business training course for light leaders, specifically those in the health and wellness community. And I'm calling it Light Leader Academy. I love and it. so it's a six month online program with a four day accelerator retreat experience on the ground. So there'll be workshops and, and fun day adventures and stuff like that. And actually, I think JP's going to be a part of that too. He's oh, going to be awesome. teaching viral video content creation. Um, so oh, just cool. lots of fun stuff coming together for that. And so that's really my dream project. It's oh, really the, gosh. it's for like sure. what everything has led to, right? It's like all yeah. the experience I've been through. This is what's now the, the culmination of all of that. And so it's the biggest program I've ever put together. And so it's a little scary, but I'm doing it anyway. And I'm oh, excited about it. I'm so, I'm like, I sign me up. I want to go so bad. Um, and I love that you kind of brought in JP here because it's, I think it's so cool that you've been on your path doing your thing. JP has been on his path doing his thing. You guys come together and it blends so beautifully to bring more goodness. It's like synergistic and the goodness it can bring for people. That's so cool. Yeah, it's definitely been interesting. We have very different lives and different paths, but we have a very similar mission. So it's funny. How did you guys meet? So we met in Costa Rica, actually, mm -hmm. which is so interesting because I remember, yeah, I was living in Costa Rica for the last six years full time and wow. living in a very small little beach town, you know, one that, yeah, a lot of tourists come through there, but the likelihood of me meeting the man of my dreams, it was yeah. very unlikely. And so I remember thinking like, I don't know how this is going to happen, Amber, if you stay in the jungle for several <laughs> more years. So I was invited to teach at this retreat called International Tribe Design that our good friend Daniel Eisenman puts on a couple times a year. And so we were invited to be facilitators at this retreat that happened in Costa Rica. This was about two and a half years ago now. And 
so JP was teaching like a conscious communication workshop. I was teaching a Pilates and yoga workshop Mm -hmm. and we met there and it was like, oh my gosh, who are you? Like Mm -hmm. soul recognition. Mm -hmm. I've never experienced any sort of what I would call soul recognition where I went, I know you and Mm -hmm. you're the one I've been looking for. That sort of just light switch went on inside of both of us. And at the time I was, um, at the tail end of another relationship and, and trying to close that down kind of on and off with my last boyfriend. And so I was just getting to know JP as a friend, of course, at that time. And then a couple of weeks go by and I ended up ending my relationship for good with my ex. <laughs> You're like, I'm and, not wasting any more time. <laughs> yeah. I was just like, you know, cause I, I knew it wasn't working. We were on and off for like a good, you know, two years and it just, we were business partners. Mm-hmm. It just wasn't a good situation for mm-hmm. us both to be in. So I decided I've got to I've got to change things up in a big way. Um, and part of that that retreat really opened my eyes to what was possible for me in terms of the type of partner I wanted to really call in, like my dream soulmate partner, what that looked like, what that could feel like. There was a lot of amazing men that were part of this retreat, a lot of amazing women. I remember just seeing, wow, like this is what's possible for me. And why am I choosing to stay in a relationship that doesn't feel that way? So I ended that relationship and then I reached out to JP just saying like, hey, I'd love to get to know you more. And he immediately texted me back and I was kind of shocked. I was like, okay, like, cause he had told me, you know, I really feel super <laughs> <not>. strongly. <laughs> like, so, so, bef- so before, before we left the retreat, he's like, I don't know. I, I, I probably sound crazy, but I feel so strongly connected to you. I feel so much towards you and I'd really love to get to know you more. And I was like, I, I feel really strongly towards you too, but I need to basically close out this relationship that's been on and off for a while. And before I even consider chatting with you. And so he was like, yeah, cool. So Anyway, this was weeks later. I ended up texting him. And so for the next three months, we talked on Skype for like an hour to a night. And we just got to know each other for three months. So just getting just everything, anything and everything talking. And so finally he was able, because he was on his book tour at that time, all around the U.S. He had just launched his book. And I was in back-to-back retreats and productions down in Costa Rica. And I couldn't leave. And he couldn't leave. So finally, three months later, he comes down to Costa Rica for our first like official date which was 10 days in Costa Rica. So he stayed with me. I took him all around. We had so much fun. And to this day, he'll even say it, he'll share that like on the way into Costa Rica on the flight, he was writing in his journal how he was going down to meet his future wife because oh, he knew, like we both knew wow. so early on that we were meant to be together. Oh. And we both, it was very interesting because we both didn't want to get married. When we met, yeah. both of us were like, we don't want to get married. We want to have kids. Like we were both that like solo entrepreneur like right. not interested in kids, marriage, babies, like the whole thing. We just weren't into it. And now we're we're married almost a year now and we're wanting to start to try to have our first baby starting oh, wow. in August. Oh, wow. And it's all because we found each other. We realized we're the right people. Like we, the yeah. reason nothing else worked out was because of, of JP, you know? Um, <laughs> so that's how, that's how it feels. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So, so that, that was, was your truth, truth back, back then, then because yeah. Yeah. You hadn't found each other yet. <laughs> yeah. So your hearts weren't in that place. Oh yeah. Oh my gosh. I love that so much. I like, I'm sitting here like, man, with these two very highly aware spiritual people, like, what do you guys talk about <laughs> at home? Or do you always, are you constantly hitting deep levels on just, you know, philosophical talk or is it JP joking about veganism or what do you guys, what do you guys chat about most? (laughs) You you know, that's a great question because we do so much talking and serving and extroverting with our work that oftentimes when we have downtime together, we don't do a lot of talking because we just kind of just being together feels so good. And, you know, he's always on podcasts or shooting videos and I'm always on calls with my clients or, you know, out teaching. And so we do so much talking and extroverting that most, a lot of our time is together is like we go adventure and we go do stuff, but it's not a ton of like deep dive conversations. We do have those conversations, but it's, I would, I would say that it's less than maybe the average couple just because we do so much of that already. Right. Um, but then, you know, definitely you know jp's always trying to crack jokes with me and i i feel like i'm the the sword or i'm i'm the stone that sharpens his sword because i don't really laugh at a lot of his jokes like i used to laugh at everything he said and there are some people who like just laugh at everything he says and i'm just like uh like no it doesn't it doesn't 
rub me the right way because I'm so used to it now. You know, that's part of it. <laughs> right. And so it's good because then he can try out material on me, and I'm 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 kind of a tough tough crowd. So he's I love it. <laughs> it's funny. Uh, it, yeah, probably it probably is, is such, such a huge reward, reward to him now <laughs> if he can make you laugh. <laughs> that's it. That's it. And I've and I've also definitely become I think one of his greater muses because he gets a lot of his material from like the way that I live my lifestyle because I've you know mm-hmm. I've been vegan I've for heard ten it. years. I've been a yogi. <laughs> like the parenting stuff that he he's drawing a lot on his own life right now in his comedy routine and that's great like I I love that but I have friends who are like are you okay with all the jokes he makes about you and I'm like I'm totally cool with it because I know it comes from a a place of love it doesn't come from a place of criticism and judgment it actually comes from a place of love so I can laugh at myself you know it's good for me to laugh at myself for (laughs) sure and I've heard his comedy routine a couple times recently oh yeah and um he Puts it off like you don't know he's joking about him, which is hilarious in and of itself. (laughs) Because everyone knows that you know. Yeah. But it was funny to meet you because um, I went to see him with my friend Drew Manning. And JP was joking about you with like your kind of hippie spiritual stuff, right? Yeah. 1111. And Drew was just dying and elbowing me. He's like, that's you. That's you. (laughs) And um, it, it was just so cool to run into you at Paleo Effects like that. And I think yeah. that there's something about when you are connected to a certain energy, like a plant energy, I just feel like it connects human beings in a certain way. Yeah. Um, and you kind of start to speak the same talk and walk the same walk and be interested in similar things. And it just, it's very connective. So it was so cool to meet yeah. you and see what you're doing. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I know. I, I couldn't agree with you more. I think, you know, when you start working with plant medicines, you're really connected to spirit in a big yes. way. And spirit's always guiding people's interactions, I strongly right. believe. And the synchronicities of meeting people, like I walked into Paleo FX that day and I met all these amazing people raw, all at the same time. It was like this convergence <laughs> of all these people on the floor. <laughs> I'm like, wow, this is so cool. And and I know yeah, it's all so divinely sure. orchestrated. And so much of it has to do with the work that we've done with plant medicines to shift our energy field and you know, our frequencies so that we are all being attracted to each other. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. yeah it's, it's been amazing, amazing to have conversations, conversations since paleo effects. And, you know, people are like, Oh, I know this person who, and we're working on the same project and we didn't even know it, you know? Right. So <laughs> that's why I'm such a huge fan of like putting myself out there and getting out to events and things, because I feel like it just puts you in a position in which you're allowing the universe or God or mother nature, or whatever you believe in to guide you and use you. <laughs> I couldn't agree more. And that's actually something I, I really loved about Paleo FX is that it really reignited that want and need for me to go out and be going to events and meeting mm-hmm. people all the time and, and just having great conversations. Like to me, that's the beauty of life is to be able to share yes. deep yes. conversations. And that's why I'm so falling in love with podcasts too, because I'm just like, wow, look at this opportunity for us to sit and deep dive into stuff that maybe we, most people, you know, maybe wouldn't hear in their their life, in their life, right? This sort of conversation. So it's really fun. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. All right. My last question, I kind of wanted to dig into the yoga side of things because we kind of hit on it, but why do you incorporate that in your retreats and just what has your experience been like with yoga? Yeah. So yoga has been so profound for me. I think you know, coming into yoga as a dancer or as an athlete, you know, I know a lot of fitness professionals find yoga, let's say after, you know, they've been teaching for years and and training for years. And just like me, you know, I found it at the peak level of my dance career. And I, I had no idea how much I needed it until I was started to really train. And so the first thing I thought was like, well, this is so easy. It's basically glorified stretching. Like I can stretch, I can make a lot of pretty shapes. I'm very flexible, hypermobile mm-hmm. already. So it are, so it, it kind of exaggerated that in me. But what I didn't know and what my ego needed a big check in was that it's not about the poses. It's about the presence and the breath mm-hmm. and how present is your mind and how focused is your mind during the physical movement. And so, yes, I can align my bones properly and make a perfect shape, but where's my head space at mm-hmm. in that moment? And so I had one of my great teachers. She was just like, so you might be able to make the pose, but where's your mind? And I went, ooh, she got me, you know? And that's really, that's really where this work took me was 
into the space of how can I focus my mind and be present. So yoga has taught me how to be present and how to enjoy life fully by being present because, of course, life only exists now. And so much of our lives we spend trapped in our past thoughts and stories and our future projections of what's going to come ahead, and we lose the, the joy of being present now. And so yoga has taught me that. And every day I practice yoga, I become a better human being because I learn how to uh, – experience myself and feel the emotions that my body is helping me feel Mm -hmm. and tap into the wisdom of the body and also quiet the mind, which is huge, like Mm -hmm. absolutely huge. To be able to quiet the the monkey mind and the chatter that happens every day has changed everything in my life from how I focus on my work and and am efficient and productive in my work to how I connect with my partner because I can be present and listen to him and hear where he's coming from, you know, to being able to feel my body and unlock a lot of emotional baggage that I've been carrying in my physical body. So there's so many aspects of yoga that I just absolutely love, which is why I keep teaching it. It's why I um, practice it every single day. And uh, I think it'll always be a threat in my life, um, not only for the physical benefits, but the mental and emotional benefits. Mm, I love that so much. I love the focus on, yeah, but where's your mind at right now? Um, That speaks to me. That's honestly why I named this podcast Inside Out Health um, is because so much of the physical things that I've done have helped me tune in to my mind, right? And there was a time, there was a time that I wanted to tune out and not think Right. and release. And that was, that did not lead me to a path of happiness. Right. <laughs> and honestly, the first step for me to really tuning in was plant medicines because I put myself in a situation where it was like, you're just here with your thoughts and that's it. And there's no tuning out now. <laughs> you're forced to face it. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. And it was very eye opening. And I think meditation has been a really nice follow up to that. Great. Um, yeah. And yeah. yoga has just been this intensified <laughs> version of that. Mm-hmm. And I love also that you said that in the beginning, I think you said that you lead with your heart. Yeah. When I hear that, like, I know you're not just saying that, like, as a little colloquialism. Um, I, one of my most profound experiences in the ayahuasca ceremony was in the beginning, um, my mind was just racing. Yeah. Because the first two nights, we did it four nights in a row. And the first two nights, I hadn't really had much of an experience. You know, I was just kind of in deep meditation. Nothing like other people were like, I was having this crazy vision of all these things. I was like, I'm not having any of that, right? Yeah. And I was trying not to get jealous, but I was a little bit. I was like, I want one of those cool things. Um, so the third night, I started to kind of go into a more powerful experience. And I could hear my mind, in my mind, I was saying, oh my gosh, like it's happening. Oh, cool. Oh, I can't wait to tell everybody. And I literally could hear myself saying, and then this happened. And then this happened. Like I wasn't in the moment at all. I was like way into the future telling people about my experience. And it was, um, and I felt this pressure on my heart. Like I, I opened my eyes because I thought somebody came over and touch my heart. You know, I mean, it really, really felt like it. And I was like, oh, no one's there, but it still felt like it was there. And I heard this, you know, thought in my mind that said, think here. Like, and it was just like, shh, <laughs> think here. And as soon as I thought through my heart, my mind just completely cleared up and I went deep into an experience that was very sacred to me. Wow. Um, and I think that yoga and meditation can do that for us without, you know, because not everyone who hears this might not be willing or want to do plant medicine. Yeah, But I 100% believe that it can be very closely achieved through meditation and things like yoga. And they just help us tune in to our heart and to clear our mind enough that we can actually listen and hear. That's it. That's it. Totally. And I think, you know, the art of really living a joyful um, free life, like one that's, that's, um, yeah, full of unconditional love and trust and acceptance Mm -hmm. and on all the good things. Mm -hmm. It requires us to really begin to tap into our heart and our intuition in a way that many of us have just been taught not to, right? Mm -hmm. We've forgotten the power of the heart. The mind is so powerful and and fear is so powerful. Mm -hmm. And so much of us are living in a state of fear, Mm -hmm. anxiety, you know, stress constantly. Mm -hmm. 
And so we've lost the connection to the spirit, lost the connection to the heart. And that's really, I strongly believe the heart is the guiding light in in life in general. Like if we, if you aren't following your heart, it's going to be a rocky road (laughs) Mm -hmm. because you're going to find you're suffering along the journey so much because you're not actually following what fulfills you or what it, what makes you happy. Right. Mm -hmm. And so if you can tune in and begin to lead your life from your heart and create your life around the things that lights your heart up, then I think you're, you're winning regardless. You're going to win no matter what you do, because you're going to be fulfilled and happy. Mm -hmm. And, um, but you know, there's a lot of healing to do in the heart. And that's the reason I love this work specifically yoga, um, and meditation and plant medicine is because it helps us tap into that heart space and understand and begin to accept the, the dark and the light aspects of ourselves. So this is something that I wanted to bring up about yoga. When I first dove into yoga, I was learning a lot about the different philosophies in the, in the different lineages I was studying. And so much of it was about self-acceptance and, and embracing all aspects of self, the imperfect, the perfect, the dark and the light. And that was a huge concept to me. Cause I was like, what I can, I don't, I can actually embrace and shine the light of awareness on the shadow aspects of me and not be ashamed of them and hide them anymore. I can actually embrace them and and accept all the imperfections because I was a total type A perfectionist, you know, work workaholic most of my life. And so yoga helped me soften so much into accepting myself as who I am. And I struggled with severe bulimia in my early uh, 20s, um, like five years of intense bulimia and so much of it was rooted in lack of self-worth and lack of self-confidence and all of that and the external pressures I was putting on myself to be mm-hmm. perfect right and so dancing. yoga yeah dance and the, and the performance the competition like there's right. so much pressure as a young girl on your body right your physical mm-hmm. body is being judged mm-hmm. and criticized and so I developed this like I didn't even realize you know I was developing this this disordered thinking about myself and so um yoga really helped me start to unwind and, and fix a lot of that, you know, those old belief systems. And then of course the plant medicine took it a lot deeper by helping me actually clear the energetics of, of what the root was. But, um, yoga was really that first door I walked through that was like, Mm -hmm. oh, I could actually live in a state of acceptance Mm -hmm. (laughs) and begin to love myself Mm -hmm. fully. Mm -hmm. Um, and also not try to aspire to perfection because that's impossible and completely unattainable, but there was, you know, this part of me that believed it was possible. So anyway, just lots of beautiful lessons. That's, that's that's exactly what yoga yoga is doing for me right right now. now. Like I'm going through some huge huge shifts shifts. and you know, people who follow me on my Instagram Instagram story, they're probably like, yes, Tara, we know you like yoga. (laughs) I'm just like, guys, it's so amazing. It's like therapy and spiritual and it's fixing my body and I love myself. I mean, it's just so good on every level. I'm but so if, glad. if you don't mind, um, because I coach people one-on-one, sure, I've become aware that a lot of people do deal with bulimia or anorexia or some sort of at least severe binging episodes. Um, would you mind sharing some of the like epiphanies that you had that helped you get out of that? A thousand percent because, um, yeah, as you know, the statistics, it's like three in every four women have some sort of eating disorder in their life. <laughs> it's, it's rampant nowadays. And I love talking about it because for me, it was a huge process of, of different tools, right? I, I discovered different tools that really helped me along the journey, but I knew that I was the only one that could get myself out of it because it was in my own headspace. Like I had created this cage for myself in my mind. And so what initially started, because I hid this from people, everyone, I think my, my, um, even my, my partner at the time didn't know I was bulimic, mm-hmm. my partner of like, you know, two years, mm-hmm. really good at hiding it. Um, and I remember sharing it with my family like once or twice, but they didn't know how to help me. And so they were kind of like, oh, you should go see a counselor. But that was kind of the end of it. They never wanted yeah. to talk about it. And, and uh-huh. I understood that, but I felt like I was so alone and so isolated. Yeah. And so what really shifted me initially was, first of all, I hit rock bottom. Like I remember five years in suffering so much and just being, I remember I purged my dinner this one night and I said, this is it. Like I have to reach out for help. I have no way. Like I thought I was doing all the things. I was taking yoga classes. I was meditating. I was eating really clean, but I was still purging. And this habit, I just, it was all rooted in, in, in guilt and shame and lack of self-worth and all of this stuff. So I didn't know how to access that emotional stuff. 
And I didn't know where else to go. So I started, so I actually opened up to my boyfriend at the time and he was super supportive. And it was so fascinating how just talking about it Mm -hmm. took the weight off me. It was like this big weight of, okay, it's no longer a secret. I'm no longer alone. Mm -hmm. So talking about it with friends and family and reaching out for help is super important. And knowing that you're not alone because almost every woman has dealt with some version of this in their life, which is tragic, but it's real. And so you're not alone, but I think it's very easy to isolate yourself because you you create so much guilt and shame is created in the cycles that it's almost unbearable. Like, what are people going to think if I share this? Like, they're going to think less of me. That was my biggest fear. They're going to think less of me if I share this, when in actuality, you need to share it to heal. There's no other way to go about it. Like, you can't hide this and, pr- and pretend like it's going to fix itself. Like, I, I thought that, right? So sharing it was huge. Then once I started sharing it and talking about it, I still kept it to myself. I wasn't, like, public about it, but it was definitely something that I was – I, my partner knew about, so he could hold me accountable and check in with me and see how I was doing. Mm -hmm. Um, but really it was yoga meditation. It was talking to people. It was working with plant medicine. I mean, I owe so much of my healing to working with ayahuasca because it was able to show me even years later when I first sat in my ceremony and I was no longer actually playing out the behaviors, like the purging behavior. Um, I still had the mind right? still the mindset. So I would still get those, those beliefs and those thoughts that would come in about like, oh, you should just go purge your dinner. Like, you know, that inner dot, that inner devil that would always, you know, oh, you should go purge that right now. Like that inner voice was still there, even though I wasn't acting out the behavior. So with that being said, I, when I first sat in my couple of ceremonies, I was able to see the emotional root and the time in my life that was really the root to why I had this pattern. And I was able to process that and feel it and cry it out. Because this is another thing that I think many of us do is we don't let ourselves feel the emotions mm-hmm. that we are, that are really the root to the problem. So if I let myself feel all of the pressure and the pain mm-hmm. that I was experiencing as a child growing up in the competitive dance world, because I didn't, I didn't let myself cry for 10 years. I had this hard shell. No one can get to me. No one's, no one's opinion matters. Yeah, right. Like I was being judged every single weekend on the stage and I pretended as though I wasn't affected by it, but I was. Mm -hmm. And so all of this emotional baggage is building, right? It's building, it's building, it's building. And that's what triggered this behavior and this mindset shift as I grew and got older. And I didn't understand that until I sat my ceremony that that was the emotional root to why I was doing this. And so then I was like, oh, so then I know I cried it out. I journaled about it. I processed it, you know, journaling is really powerful for sharing how you're feeling inside and just getting it all out on paper and being willing to feel the feelings. I wasn't willing to feel the feelings. I wasn't feeling willing to feel the guilt and the shame and the sadness and the anger and the, and the frustration. Like I wasn't willing to feel it. I just kept stuffing it down. And this this will hurt too bad. (laughs) Right. Right. And so I tried to control everything. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And the control was how I coped with this inability to feel stuff. Right. Mm -hmm. And so what I would say to those who are listening, who are battling any sort of eating disorder to any level is to first and foremost, let yourself feel what you're not willing to let yourself feel. So if what I started doing is if I was going to go purge and I had the inkling to go purge, I would sit there and make myself feel the anxiety, the stress, the shame, the guilt, whatever it was that I was trying to avoid by purging. Mm -hmm. Right. Because I was trying to avoid a feeling, the Mm -hmm. feeling of I'm full. Ooh, I don't like the way this feels inside of me, whatever it was. I would let myself feel it. And by doing that, it stopped the behavior. The behavior no longer wow. became this, this coping mechanism. Because really, it's a coping mechanism for an underlying emotional something. Whether it's like you need control, you're in a state of fear, you're, ang- you're anxious. You're, when you get to the root and understand what emotion it is, then you can sit in it, feel it, and then it passes. And you're like, oh, it's been two minutes and I don't need to purge all of a sudden. Like, you know what I mean? So mm-hmm. it, if, but it requires you to be willing to sit. And just feel, you know, and that takes courage because most of us walking out in our everyday life, we are avoiding feeling things and we use alcohol and drugs and all sorts of different things to numb the pain of feeling things. And it's like, wait, but we're like emotional beings. Like we're supposed to feel things. We're supposed to feel things so that we can learn and grow from things. But if we never feel anything, we're not going to experience joy and we're not going to experience sadness. We're not going to experience any of the, the beauty of life either. Right. Um, And so that's what I also realized is that by me not being willing to feel the guilt, the shame, 
all the lower vibrational emotions, I also wasn't experiencing the ultimate joy I could in my life because you can't selectively numb emotion. If you numb an emotion, you move, you, you numb all of them. So I wasn't experiencing joy and excitement and fun and celebration in my life because I wasn't letting myself feel anything. Right. You know? Wow. And so the emotional intelligence piece is huge. And Brene Brown is a badass <laughs> at this. Mention her too. Like vulnerability <laughs> 101. Yeah. This is what emotions are. This is what vulnerability is. Like learn that stuff because it will change your life. Yeah. yeah. As you were talking about that, I, her quote came to my mind that she says, if you put shame in a Petri dish, it needs three things to survive. And that's secrecy, silence, and judgment. Oh, so good. Yeah. And, um, I wanted to ask you like for people listening, if they're having bulimia or whatever it is, binging or whatever habit, maybe it's a sex addiction or a drug addiction or whatever it is. Do you feel like it was important to first tell someone before you went into that place of feeling? Cause I feel like the safer route, if I was hearing this, I'd be like, okay, I'm just gonna do that feeling thing and still keep this a secret, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So do you feel like that had to come first? I feel like I was doing a lot of the stuff that I, you know, using the tools and stuff before I, I shared anything with anybody, I was trying to do it all on my own. Right. Yeah. And part of, part of the, part of the, um, the mental, disorder, let's say, is that you think you have to do it all on your own and that you think that you, you can heal from, you, you can fix some, you can fix something that's broken that you broke, <laughs> right? Like, and, 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 and in all, in all reason, yes, you are the ultimate creator of your life. You can take full responsibility for yourself and you are the one who can only change your life, right? hands down. Right. But there's also the power of releasing the secret because part of the guilt and shame is about the secret. So if you can talk about it, all of a sudden that guilt and shame can release because it's no longer a secret. People know, and you're no longer hiding anything. Right. And so, so much of the healing process is you've got to be open and accepting of, of who you are and where you're at. You're not going to heal and be able to forgive yourself and accept yourself if you can't even share. Right. right. And so th I would definitely say that sharing with a close friend, you know, a confidant, someone who, you know, was not going to go share it with the world. If you really want to, you know, I wouldn't suggest posting this publicly, of course, but I would just suggest, you know, like your, your tight family and friends, yeah. like talking to people about it because you're going to realize very quickly that almost everyone has gone through something similar totally. and no one's talking about it. And I think the, the most detrimental thing about eating disorders is that no one's talking about it. Totally. And women are suffering, men and women, but really women are suffering silently. Yes. And they're competing with each other silently and the comparison syndrome silently and all of this happening. And it's time to take, it's time to rip the, the veil back and say, look, this is what all, this is all the junk that everyone's carrying. Yeah. And if we can look at all of that, then we understand we're not alone and everything shifts when you realize you're not alone. Oh, yeah. so beautifully put. Mm -hmm. Wow. Amber, Amber, thank you so much. <laughs> yes, you're welcome. Oh, and where can people find out more about your retreats and your new coaching program and all of that? Yeah. So epicself.com is my main home base online. Y'all can find me there. Also epicself.com or excuse me, epicself on Instagram is Instagram is my favorite social yes, media platform. It's beautiful. So feel free to reach out to me there. And I love chatting via DM. And so feel free to shoot me an email or message there and love to connect. You're so sweet. Oh my gosh. Amber, Amber. thank you so much. Yes, you're welcome. Thank you so much for having me. It's been so fun. It has. <laughs>